1950. Five years since the defeat of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Such were the scars of history's most destructive conflict that the world seemed unrecognizable to the one that existed just a decade earlier. Empires were collapsing, ideologies and nationalism expanding, and in the new world order, powers both old and new wrestled to establish their place on the geopolitical map and all of this was taking place under the threat of the mushroom cloud of nuclear weapons. Acting as something of a reverie, trying desperately to prevent another global catastrophe was the United Nations. Established in 1942, while the bombs were still falling around the world. Still a relatively new factor in global events, the UN would find its position tested for the first time, when on the Korean Peninsula, the future of the Korean people, freed from years of Japanese occupation, found themselves acting as a proxy for the struggle of the so-called Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective allies. Split in two along the 38th parallel, victory for the pro-West South or the Communist North would strike a blow for their respective benefactors in Washington or Moscow, preventing their opponents' expansion of power in the region and possibly influencing events elsewhere in the world in their favor. This is the story of the Korean War where the superpowers began their fight for global dominance and left behind a land divided and still to this day living under the threat of nuclear weapons. In the final weeks of World War II, with Nazi Germany having been defeated, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and launched an invasion of Japanese-held territory in Asia. The Soviet Union had signed a neutrality pact with Japan in 1941, which both sides abided by for much of World War II. But at the Tehran and Yalta conferences, Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin agreed to dissolve the agreement and join in the war against Tokyo once Hitler had been dealt with. Stalin amassed an army under the command of Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky, which, after he declared war on the Japanese Empire on August 8, 1945, swept into Japanese-held China, Korea, and the Kuril Islands. Despite numbering over a million men, Japanese forces were all but beaten and by the end of a comparatively short engagement, the Soviets had only lost around 8,000 troops, compared to 80,000 by Japan. With the Soviet invasion coinciding with the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japanese Emperor Hirohito was forced to surrender on August 15th, bringing an end to the Second World War. As well as ending the war, the Japanese surrender also ended 35 years of Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula. And there was now a need to organize the withdrawal of Japanese troops to allow Korea to become independent. Soviet troops were already in the north, and U.S. troops were sent to the south to round the defeated Japanese up and ship them home. To avoid troops from either allied nation unintentionally firing on one another, it was decided that the 38th parallel would act as the boundary between them, effectively cutting the peninsula and its people in two. Under Soviet influence, the northern portion quickly adopted the communist style of government, while in the south, 
The government was led by the pro-West autocrat, Sigmund Rhee. Rather problematically, both governments believed they were the rightful rulers of the whole of Korea. And with their supporters soon at loggerheads elsewhere around the world, such as the Berlin Crisis of 1948, it was clear that neither Moscow nor Washington were going to permit the other from having total control of Korea. And thus, on August 15, 1948, the pro-West southern portion became the Republic of Korea, or simply South Korea. While in response, Moscow backed the creation of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, on September 9th. Yet, despite the creation of these two nations, each with distinct separate identities, there was a feeling that the Korean family had been broken by foreign influence. And both sides continued to push for unification under their own diametrically opposed ideologies and allies. With the communists winning the long-standing civil war over the northern border in China, save for the remaining nationalists on the island of Taiwan, the leaders of the New People's Republic of China adopted a foreign policy that actively promoted communist revolutions elsewhere in the world as a counter to the United States, which it viewed as the new Western imperial power exerting its influence on Asia. Encouraged by this, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung petitioned Stalin to provide military equipment for the North Korean army to invade the South, believing that his people could achieve a quick victory before the U.S. and its allies could respond effectively. Stalin was initially hesitant, but ultimately agreed to supply tanks and aircraft from the Red Army's vast wartime stocks. These including large numbers of excellent T-34-85 medium tanks and the Ilyushin Il-10 ground attack aircraft. This support afforded Stalin a significant amount of influence over Kim Il-sung, forcing the North Korean leader to postpone his ambitious plan a handful of times until Stalin thought the North Korean army was ready. In the meantime, communist uprisings began to take place in the south, initially without influence from the north, but then actively encouraged by Kim Il-sung's government. South Korea and U.S. forces managed to largely suppress these uprisings, but Kim Il-sung believed that once the invasion began, it would encourage mass uprisings against the South Korean government, based in Seoul. Finally, in April 1950, Stalin gave Kim Il-sung his blessing to launch the invasion. Crucially, this was only given after the communist Chinese leader, Mao Zedong, pledged to send his own army should the invasion not go as well as hoped as the Soviet leader made it clear he would not openly be sending Soviet troops, knowing this would likely lead to a third world war between him and the United States, a war which almost certainly would have involved atomic weapons. Given that the war was instigated by North Korea and their Chinese and Soviet backers, it is often forgotten that had events gone slightly differently, it could have begun with South Korea invading the North. In South Korea, Ri, like his northern counterpart, made it clear that he was prepared to unify Korea by force. Mirroring Kim Il-sung's pleas with Stalin, he approached U.S. President Harry Truman for military aid in 1949, promising that with the right American equipment, 
his army could defeat the KPA within two weeks. Truman's administration was determined to protect the South, but was opposed to any action that might appear provocative to the communists, adopting instead the policy of containing Stalin and his allies. The truth was the U.S. viewed Korea as a strategically insignificant region in the wider arena in combating the communists. And on January 12, 1950, U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson made a speech about regional security that effectively ignored the peninsula, leaving some to conclude that the U.S. was prepared to surrender South Korea in order to protect the Philippines or allied occupied Japan. U.S. support at this time was therefore largely limited to maintaining a defensive posture, leaving the South Korean army with 98,808 professional soldiers in June 1950, but no significant artillery, tanks, or anti-tank weapons. The South Korean Air Force, meanwhile, numbered just over 1,000 men and 22 aircraft, none of which were fighters, while the Navy was non-existent. South Korea's waters instead being protected by a small Coast Guard. Facing them from the north were an initial cadre of 135,000 KPA troops who, as well as being equipped with T-34-85 tanks and a plethora of other weapons, from rifles to artillery, were highly motivated and led by officers and NCOs who already had a wealth of combat experience fighting with the Chinese communists against Japan and the Chinese nationalists. Additionally, they were supported by over 3,000 Soviet advisors, passing on their vital experience in armored warfare and the use of the T-34, although they themselves were strictly forbidden from participating in the fighting. At dawn, on June 25, 1950, with the blessing of Stalin and Mao, Kim Il-sung struck the south, an intense artillery barrage opened hostilities, providing a protective umbrella under which 100,000 North Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel. Almost immediately, the South Korean army found itself engaged in a fighting retreat, unable to stem the communist tide. Despite the warning signs in the months prior, the world was left stunned by the invasion, and within hours of the initial assault, the United Nations convened an emergency meeting. Conspicuous by its absence at the meeting was the Soviet Union, who were boycotting the UN for allowing the Chinese nationalists in Taiwan to continue occupying China's seat within the organization despite mainland China now being under Mao's communists. Despite Atchison's speech implying the contrary, U.S. President Truman was adamant that South Korea should not be allowed to fall. He warned that to do so was akin to the appeasement of Hitler's expansion during the 1930s, and that in order to prevent the communists from striking out from their borders elsewhere around the globe, it must be shown that the free world would retaliate. Within 48 hours, the UN had voted to pass Resolution 83, calling upon member nations to provide military forces to expel the North Koreans. But in reality, this was authorization for the U.S. to primarily involve itself in the conflict without appearing to directly threaten a Soviet client. Australia, Britain, Canada, and numerous others also all began mobilizing their armed forces. But in the meantime, 
the KPA continued to advance southwards at a rapid pace. And the day after the resolution was passed, they captured the South Korean capital of Seoul, forcing Ri to relocate his government further south to Pusan. As July arrived, so too did the initial UN forces, command of which was given to the famed U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. Admired by many for his tactical skill and aggressive nature, despised by many others as a fame-hungry egotist who bordered on being a megalomaniac. MacArthur was regarded as a household name that inspired confidence in the American public and beyond that the situation in Korea could be reversed. U.S. Navy carrier planes opened the air war on July 3rd while the first American ground unit to enter combat was Task Force Smith, assembled from elements of the American occupation forces in Japan. Having dug in on a hill north of Osan, which afforded them a grandstand view of the surrounding area, at 0730 hours, on the morning of July 5th, they spotted advanced elements of the KPA approaching them, including a number of T-34s. At 4,000 yards range, the Americans opened up with their howitzers and learned that the T-34's reputation for toughness was deserved, as a number of shells simply ricocheted off the tank's sloping armor after two and a half hours of fighting, the Americans had destroyed two T-34s and damaged two others, but it had cost them nearly their entire stock of anti-tank ammunition. Worse still, North Korean reinforcements arrived and T-34s overran the howitzer's position, leaving the U.S. infantry to begin a fighting retreat. By the end of the day, 60 Americans lay dead, 21 wounded, and 83 had been captured. While MacArthur was criticized for sending the task force in without adequate weaponry. In the coming weeks, more UN soldiers began to filter in, while Truman began to reorganize American industry to support the war although on a much smaller scale than World War II.